Okay, great. Um, so uh, Helen Moore, Dr. Helen Moore is with us today. She is an alum from the North Carolina School of Science and Math. And um, you might have read some some of her bio already on the on the uh, Comap website and the announcement for the webinar. She is um, a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, and she got her PhD in mathematics. Is that right, Helen right. At Stony Brook? Yeah. And um, has been working in the um, the the pharma bio um, area. She's a mathematical modeler. She's I've seen her give talks to students and to teachers about her work. And so we're so pleased to have her. Um, at the end of this, uh, Helen will be um, giving us some time to ask questions, but you can also put your questions in the chat. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to chat and you can see it says two panelists. And so I'll be monitoring that. And um, also when Helen kind of has some times when she wants some input from you, feel free to type in the chat so I can kind of help her keep track of that. The other thing you can know is that we'll have a recording of this, thanks to Helen, since she reminded me to record it. Um, we'll have a recording of this webinar on the mathmodels.org website. And um, there are also recordings of our previous webinars. And then um, Helen's slides will be up there to um, if you wanna have access to those later. So we invite you, you know, if you have colleagues that wanted to come and couldn't come, you can just send them the link to that website and then they can access today's talk. Um, the other thing is I'll put in a plug for our um, next webinar, which is February the 24th at 3.30 p.m. That's the 3.30 time. And that is Jack Diekman. He is going to speak to us. Um, and he is uh, from, he works with UCubed. He's the director of um, part of the UCubed organization with Joe Bowler. And um, he will be our speaker Wednesday, February 24th at 3.30. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand over Helen and thank her again for, for being here with us and thank COMAP for supporting these webinars. Thank you so much, Maria, for the invitation. Um, it is a real pleasure to get to talk to teachers. Um, I certainly miss my students that I had when I was in academia. Maria alluded to my background. I'll mention that um, she, she was a mathematics teacher at my alma mater, my high school, which was an incredible experience. And I did get a PhD in mathematics. Immediately after that, I went to academia. Uh, and I'll say when I was in high school, I just loved math. When I was in college, I explored math and physics, wasn't sure, decided on math eventually and got the PhD in math, but was really doing very pure mathematics, what we call foundational mathematics. Um, having a lot of fun with shapes on the whiteboard or thinking um, thinking in my head and then figuring out some things I could, I could imagine. So there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes for the mathematical theory that we then can apply for problems like this one. It was only after I'd spent 11 years in academia that I moved into industry with um, an opportunity I was not expecting. And I started working at Genentech. Um, I've also worked at Bristol Myers Squibb and AstraZeneca. I'm currently at Applied Biomath. We really focus on providing the mathematical modeling for other companies, companies that are trying to develop therapies. And as I was mentioning to Maria earlier, there is a real need for more people who have the quantitative training and are willing to come and work in industry on these types of problems, which was my motivation. Just the desire to have more impact drove me to, um, to, to accept a position and offer in industry. And I'm so glad I did. It's been a great experience. I've learned a ton. There are many opportunities. If you or your students are thinking about this, I'm, I'm just... Um, Really excited if we can get more people who have that academic training in mathematical methods and come and work on these problems. All right, so with that um, preamble, I will start by talking about this, um, this whole paradigm that shifted and that was driven by a single mathematical equation. So it's a great example to share with students um, calculus students at beginning calculus or um, second semester, once they've seen some basic integration techniques, they can, they can understand this. In fact, they can read the paper with differential equations. And in fact, you can even show a, a version of this that uses equations for lines. So there are different levels at which this can be presented. But I'm going to go the, um, the full calculus method today, and I'm going to be talking about human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. So, 
Uh, this is a virus that was identified in 1983. Um, actually, the, um, the symptoms, the immunosuppression that it causes, those were identified earlier than 1983. And, um, and that's called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. We call it AIDS. So that virus is the cause of that disease. And um, in the early 80s, very early on, it was realized there were clusters of people who were having um, different infections or, or aggressive cancers that usually if you had a sufficient immune system, you would not have. Uh, so there were, they were being, there were people who were dying because of those infections and um, immune suppression. So um, there's a factor about the um, virus that we knew very early on that's relevant for the talk today. And so I will just put that out there. It has a very fast mutation rate, a really incredibly rapid. There are a few other um, features of the virus that make it particularly pernicious. It is a really um, tough one. So it has been tough. We don't have a vaccine. Um, so there are, there are many factors that go into that, but in particular, it has a very fast mutation rate. And there is, um, there was early work on therapies to prove therapies for um, patients with HIV. And zidovudine was the first antiretroviral therapy approved. That was 1987. So that's the time frame we're talking about. Um, for some of us, that doesn't seem so long ago. And uh, so, so that was the framework in which this work was done. Now, here are some typical data. Uh, these represent some viral loads over time, and um, I've got points here over, over about an eight-year span. I'm showing what, what might happen in a typical patient, but these viral counts might be roughly up and down. Um, that can be experimental or measurement error, and then they start to grow. So what we had as an understanding at that time, you know, not really understanding a lot about this um, disease was that the, this virus uh, comes into host um, comes into a host and has this type of um, inhabitation. It, it, it inhabits cells in the host, and uh, then it clearly starts to reproduce. It clearly is reproducing. We can um, there's no question that there are more, um, and so so we could uh, we could gain that we can gain that from the data so because of these types of data we had an estimate of the lifespan of the virus it was about eight or ten years because if it doesn't reproduce until eight or ten years it has to live at least that long in order to be able to do that so when we were thinking about the therapies the high mutation rate um, when it starts to reproduce which during reproduction is when it's going to make um, errors, copy errors, that's called the mutations, typically for viruses, it's when they reproduce. So when we think about the therapies, um, that factors in to how we might give therapies, uh, assuming we might have, we might be fortunate enough to have two therapies at a time. So let's say we're in that setting, which was not 1987. It was not when uh, Zidovudine was um, approved, but it was later in the early 90s when uh, other classes of drugs were being tested. So I won't go into that, um, but I can talk a lot more if you're interested. So, um, so let's say that we have two different drugs that we can use, drug A and drug B. So if we give drug A until it stops working, then the, the thinking goes, then we would have another drug in our, our pocket to pull out and give, the, give our patients when the drug A stops working. So we can then give drug B. Now, the thing about those drugs that we uh, were being developed at the early times was that they did stop working. So it was really a game. It's trying to game the system. How can we buy extra time? Is there a way to strategize our drug regimens, possibly with combinations, possibly sequentially, to help our patients as long as possible? Um, and so if we give drugs A and B at the same time, is that going to be better or worse than first giving drug A and then when it stops working, having another drug that we can use? The answer to that actually depends on whether resistance is there at the beginning. So let me explain a little bit more about that. So why is resistance important? If 
If the virus is already resistant to both A and B, if you already have some virus particles, which I'm gonna call virions, that's what the, um, the researchers call them. So each individual, so the virus, HIV virus is a disease, you know, disease causing organism and um, any particular particle of virus is a virion. So um, if the virus is already resistant to both, there's some virion that's resistant to both. So that's what we mean by saying the virus is resistant. There's some, not all virions in, in the patient would be resistant to both, but at least some are present. And if that happens, then it's actually pretty similar to having a single drug at once because you already have a virion that's resistant. All you have to do is wait until it can grow, grow out and become the dominant virion type, and then drugs A and B will not work. So that would be similar. If we already had a virion that was resistant to both, it would be just the same as having a single drug because if, the, if we gave a single drug and there is a virion that's resistant to just that drug, it still takes that amount of time roughly um, for us to lose efficacy for the drug A to stop working. So, but then that changes if there are chances for mutation during therapy. What I was just talking about was if we have the presence of a resistant virus, the resistant virion before we give the therapy. So um, are there chances for mutation during the therapy? Could that be the cause of the drugs to stop working? In order for that to be true, we would have to have some reproduction. And so then we're talking about years, but the drugs stopped working on the order of months, months or less than a year. So there was this really big puzzle. Why is that happening? Is it mutation? Is there something else that can be, there can be multiple causes for drugs to stop working. So here, in fact, I'm gonna um, jump to talking about the HIV lifespan. What's the typical lifespan of a virion? So it was thought, as I said, I'm just putting this in, in words here again, that um, probably around 10 years, could be more, could be a little less, could be, could be around 10 years. And I also want to make the disclaimer that I'm claiming that a virus has a lifespan. So that implies that the virus is alive, which actually is not technically correct because a virus cannot reproduce without another organism being present. It has to infect an organism in order to reproduce. So we don't actually call it a living organism, but I'm going to talk as if it is because if there is um, viable virus, so the virus is able to continue and, and get into a, a cell, a host cell infected and reproduce, then we'll say it's a viable virus particle, so a vi viable virion. And, um, and so I'll just talk about that being the lifespan. How long is there, how long is it viable um, in the host? So um, the lifespan is the piece of the puzzle I wanna focus on. And in 1995, David Ho and Alan Perelson used mathematics to get a very accurate estimate of the lifespan. David Ho was the researcher, experimentalist, and treating patients. Actually, he was a clinician. And Alan Perelson was a math modeler with some kind of biophysics background, in fact. Um, but they focused on the lifespan because this might help settle the debate about why the drugs that we had at the time would stop working after on the order of months. So I'm going to leave that as um, the motivation for the work. And then I'm going to tie it together after I show you the mathematics to explain why is the lifespan the piece of the puzzle that we needed, the missing piece. So let's now look at the mathematics. And I'm going to start with a mathematical model where I've got V representing the concentration of virions, that's how we spell virions right there, um, in a patient's blood plasma at time t. That's very technical, it's just the concentration. V is the concentration of virus at time t. I will alternate using virion and virus. Um, so you can always call it either one. And, um, and so we're gonna look at a rate of change of the virus with respect to time, because we're gonna collect some data. We're gonna look at some patient data and their data over time. So we're going to look at how that virus level changes with respect to time. What does it look like over time? And um, this quantity has a name, a mathematical term we call it. So I'd love if people could just chat, just to make sure I'm, I'm getting people following. What's the name of this quantity dv dt? I can't actually see the chat, so I'm going to rely on you, Maria, for this part. Yep, I'm watching. Super, thank you. 
So I encourage folks to chat to chat. Yay. I've got somebody that says a derivative. Excellent. Okay. Oh, another one that says a derivative. Excellent. <laughs> so, and that's what I'm hoping we'll do. I'm going to ask a series of questions for this just to kind of get some um, discovery um, opportunity for people to think and then figure it out. And then, of course, this was an easy one for a lot of the audience who's had had this recently or taught this recently, um, just to warm up. So, yes, this is called a derivative. Thank you for your help uh, volunteering those uh, those chat responses. And so um, when we think about a rate of change, we're really going to combine things that increase the V and things that decrease the V. So we're looking at things that are um, changing, to making the rate go in. So more virus, think about it in like a bathtub, rate in minus rate out is our rate of change. And so when we think about math modeling of real world data or real world settings, that's how we think. That's literally how we think in the field, even in the biopharma industry. That's how we think. So thinking about this um, uh, rate in minus rate out, what I want to do is try to put some pieces in there um, and, and represent things and then think about how we can get more specific and learn something from the, the uh, equation here. So I've got my rate of change represented as rate in minus rate out. Um, and so I'm going to let P represent the rate in. So P stands for a production rate function. P looks like it's a single letter all by itself, but actually behind the scenes, P could be an entire function. It could be constant, could be something very complex. At the time, it was not really known. So we have this mysterious P function for production. Then for the rate out, I'm going to let C times V be the rate out, and in this case, C is an unknown constant. I'm going to contrast that with P. P is an unknown function. C is just an unknown constant. And the reason we say that the rate out is C times V is because you can only lose part of what you have. So V is the current level. C is the fraction of that that gets um, out, goes out at any given time, um, becomes not in the viable pool of virions. And so C times V gives us the rate at which we lose virions, viable virions. So that's why we use that. That's very typical in our biological applications. If um, people haven't seen that, lots of systems where we think things have physiological meaning or biological meaning um, will say that the loss is proportional to the number there. Very typical. Um, and that has to do with um, how those things get lost and what our assumptions are about how things die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about virions be as if they're alive. So at what rates things die, what, what rate the virus dies um, is often modeled by a constant times the number there given the assumptions about how they die. So um, that gives us a model. We have, now we have a model. dv dt equals p minus c times v. So there's a mathematical term for this equation. I'd love for people to chat what you call that type of equation. Also, I just want to point out to participants too that you, I think the chat's default is to, is to the panelists, which is really just me. Um, so if you uh, could change that to, to everybody, then everybody can see your response. And that's helpful. That encourages others to respond. Yes. It reassures them that they are right, <laughs> or they are thinking about something, or that they might have a different idea that they want to contribute and make sure that they type in. So we're getting a couple different answers. Um, some people are saying differential equation, and somebody has said a, a re related rate, which is kind of an interesting calculus topic. And um, oh. there was also a comment about the fact that the way the differential equation um, is set up is that that's kind of a common thing in terms of a, um, the advanced placement exam. They talk about rates in this way, about this difference between rate in and rate out. That's great to know. Thanks for that comment. And thanks for the other comments. That's true. So we can think about this as related rates if we look at um, change in virus with respect to change in time. Um, and so we could think about the P and CV in those terms. Um, and so I would say all of these answers have been helpful. I call it a differential equation, what we're looking at here because there's a derivative in the equation, any kind of derivative, we will qualify this as a uh, differential equation. And ac excellent to point out the relationship with the related rates and the AP exam, appreciate that too. 
Um, yeah, so I'll just give this name a differential equation. So you'll have students who have seen this. Um, in this differential equation, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about that constant C. So C is what we term the per capita death rate. That may or may not be something that's also covered in the AP curriculum, uh, but that's a really useful um, way of thinking about things. It's the fraction that's lost per time, per time interval. In this case, I'm going to use units of days. So it's a per capita death rate. Uh, again, I'm talking about variants as if they're alive. So then when we think about that's the death rate, it's really the death rate. It's a C itself is the death rate constant. Let me be clear. Let me be mathematically correct. And so it is a per capita death rate. And I was careful to say C is a rate constant because C times B gives the rate, the rate out. So C by itself is not a rate unless we say it's a per capita rate. And that is a correct statement. Okay, so it's the per capita death rate. So it's per day, which means um, if we take the reciprocal, then we're getting the average lifespan. So the per capita death rate is the fraction per day. So kind of like virions per day. And then if you take the reciprocal, it's like days per virion, if you want to think about the units argument. But it is the average lifespan. So in that differential equation, we have information about the average lifespan. And I've made the point, lifespan of this virus is the key to a puzzle about how to dose the patients. All right, so solving the differential equation and fitting the curve to data would give us a way to estimate C because when we get patient data, um, that's modeling these virus levels. We get virus levels from patients and fit that curve. We can estimate the C. We can then take the reciprocal and get the lifespan, um, which would be the valuable thing for us. Now, so let me ask this question. So we've got our, um, in the third um, bullet here, we've got this differential equation. And my question is, can we solve this one or can we not? And so you might actually give an answer with a technique for solving if, you, if you, um, your answer is that yes, we can solve it. So go ahead and chat and say, can we solve this differential equation or not? And you can also give a little bit of information about your thinking. Um, and that would be nice to share, share with all everyone. So, solvable or not, this, this particular type of differential equation. We're still waiting for some responses. Here we go. Hmm. So there's some uh, there are some questions about whether or not it's a separable differential equation. Somebody said it is a separation of variables with a question mark, and somebody else asked that question. Um, somebody was concerned about the fact that p is a function. Do we know the function for p? And someone said, is it a linear DE? Could we use integrating factor or use technology? And there was another question, is P dependent on V? These are wonderful. Yeah. So um, I'll start giving some responses. Such great contributions here. Um, and the, the question, people who've asked the question, what about P? And I did make a point, P is this function, unknown function. Could it be a function of V? Yes, most likely it is. Uh, in fact, it could be a complex function of V, not necessarily linear. If it were linear, then yes, we have these techniques. And I'm really thrilled that people um, ask the question, can we use separation of variables? If P were a constant, could we do that? Waiting for more chat answers. If P were a constant, could we use um, separation of variables to solve the differential equation. Seeing a lot of yeses. Okay, great. So it really hinges on what is P, this mystery function P that we do not know. So, um, so then I will um, make the statement that we can't solve the differential equation because we don't know P. But we do, of course, we expect it depends on V, which was a very nice observation somebody uh, made the question, does it depend on V? So we expect it does. 
So because of that, we can't solve it because we don't know. We don't know if it's a linear function of B or some other function of B. We don't have information about it. So there we were. Um, so nobody was using anything like this because we couldn't get anywhere until drugs that could prevent production were developed. So um, protease inhibitors are a class of therapies um, for, for viruses, and they prevent that um, replication process. They, they prevent the HIV from producing new copies of itself. So there we're talking about our P, the function P, whatever it is, this unknown mysterious function that we don't actually know, these drugs can turn it off. So in that case, um, when, we, when we look at this, P is turned off, P is replaced by zero. So then what does our equation, what happens to our equation? What kind of equation does it become? I'll throw out some general questions and people can chat with whatever they would like to, to mention. It's much easier to, to talk about differential equations when you can verbally say it. <laughs> so folks are saying it is separable if P is zero. And they actually, a person actually typed in the new differential equation with P being zero. Um, somebody says that the change of V becomes proportional to V. Excellent. And somebody actually proposed a solution, an exponential function. <laughs> Great. People are on top of this. People are ahead of me too. <laughs> so thank you so much. I've got the di new differential equation written here as well. And um, as people have pointed out, we can use separable uh, techniques to solve this differential equation on the right, the dv dt equals minus c times v. So that is proportional to the virus counts. We know solutions there. What I'm gonna do is work through it as if we had a group of students that we were teaching. So we were testing their, their ability to do this. So that's how I'm gonna present it. So yes, this is an equation we can solve. So the development of protease inhibitors was a, was um, paradigm shifting, as I mentioned earlier. All right, so we're going to take that differential equation. We're going to solve it. See if I can get this. Uh, oops. Okay, my clicker is not quite functioning at the time I want it to. A little delay in the computer. So here's the differential equation. I flashed a little hint. What would be a good next step? What should we do to solve this differential equation? What would be a good first step? Again, putting on our student hats, how we would teach them. There's a proposal to divide both sides by V. Nice. Okay. Somebody else divided both sides by C times V. Okay. And multiplied the left-hand side by a negative. Yep. All of those are valid. We can do all of those. I'll show you which one I did. <laughs> I've got the one over V. Oh, and I've got a little extra piece there. So there's another piece. So you can divide both sides by V. We can actually divide by minus CV. Um, that will be a, a path to getting a solution. There's another piece that we can think about, and sometimes we write it out separately. I've got it all together in the next line. So um, if we're doing, if we're solving this differential equation, we're using the um, separable variables method, separable differential equations method. Then, what? How do we think of this? We've got dv dt equals minus cv. We can divide both sides by v. What would be another next step? Maybe I should add that. What's the next step after that? Someone else uh, said divide by V and then multiply by DT. Okay, okay. Great, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so that's how we think of doing this. That's what we teach. Um, so I've written it now. I've got the one over V. I divided both sides by V in the equation I'm showing here. And then what, what I've written here looks like I multiplied both sides by dt. And often when we're teaching, we say that. I'll just be very careful. This is going down for posterity onto the internet. So dv dt actually is not a fraction. It's a creature. 
just a single creature, but we're using Leibniz notation to remind ourselves where the limit um, took us when we have changes in V over T, we get a limit, we call it um, a derivative, and it, we write it as if it's a fraction. But what I can say here is that if that derivative dv dt equals minus c times v, then the differential dv, just the dv by itself when we write a differential, is equal to the whole right-hand side time, uh, times dt, the differential. So those are equivalent statements. It's just that if you have a pathological function, you have to be careful. Those aren't equivalent statements. But here, we're good. Um, so I hope I've got that all correct for posterity. And, um, and then after we think about this, the separation of variables, um, because if I'll, I'll say it, I think other people would say it if we were, if I was able to hear you, we've got the V, all, everything involving V is on the left-hand side. Everything involving T is on the right-hand side. Now there's this constant C floating around and a minus sign, and those are all fine. But everything, the one over V, the differential, DV, those are all on the left-hand side. That's, that's gonna lead us to a path to, to use this uh, separable differential equations method to solve this, what would be the next step here? We have an, a suggestion to integrate. Okay. Both I'll sides. Take that. Yeah, I'll take that suggestion. I would do exactly the same thing. Thanks for that suggestion. Um, so we want to integrate both sides. Let's start with the right hand side because it's a little easier. So uh, what is the integral of minus C dt? Uh, we're getting some suggestions, negative CT plus some constant, and they make the second constant a capital C, or <laughs> they just write the word constant. Great. I'll take that too. Uh, that's exactly what I would do next. And so I've written that that way. I'm going to call it a capital C1 to distinguish from the little c, some constant. It's unknown, um, but uh, one hint that there might be others coming along. And I'm trying to track everything very carefully just to show when we're thinking about teaching to show the students where, where these are. So what would be a next? Uh, well, actually, I'm going to ask to um, go ahead and integrate the left hand side and tell me what that would look like if that was what we were going to do next. We have a uh, natural log of the absolute value of V plus C2 people are proposing. Okay, very nice, very nice. So, um, and what I'm going to do, just given the time that I wanna spend on this and the fact that you know there's a lot of teachers in the audience who know this, um, I'm gonna go through a few next steps, but you can think about you're going, you are able to ask people about this. Um, if you were teaching a student, you could a student group, you can go through the steps and wait for their answers and you can take different paths to do this, um, to solve this differential equation. So, um, so that's excellent. I'm really um, happy that people had the absolute values in there. Sometimes our students don't, sometimes we don't remember to, or don't think about putting that in there, but it's, it's fairly important. Um, in this case, I can drop it. I can drop the absolute values because we're only deal dealing with a physical system and V is a concentration of virus. So um, it can't be negative. And in fact, the whole premise of the problem is that it's not zero. So, um, so anyway, but we can certainly drop off the absolute values. There's no problem there. And, um, and then I'm also in the same fell swoop. I'm going to move the C2 to the right-hand side, combine it with C1. We didn't know C1, we, we don't know C2. So when I combine them, it's another unknown function. I'll give it another name. It's different. I mean, sorry, function. It's a different constant. It's an unknown constant. So I'll give it a different name. So notice I've taken off the absolute values from the V. Um, and then we have this equation here. And then I would, um, if these two expressions are equal, then exponentiating them will still give equal expressions. So I have E raised to each side. I use um, 
rules of logarithms to understand e to the ln of v. Um, you might chat that. What's e to the ln of v? I think that's easy to type. Get lots of v's. OK, great. OK, so people are following. Thank you very much. So we get um, v from that. And, um, and then on the right hand side, I'm just going to separate out that C3 that was up in an exponent. I'll use rules of exponents to pull that out separately. So you can see that I've got my, um, oops, my computer's a little slow, um, my expression here for V. And then I will use one more um, uh, constant to say that E raised to an unknown constant is still an unknown constant. I will call that C4 and I'll put it in front. And in fact, I'm going to call it a different name. I'm going to call it V0. Typically, I would ask, why, but I'll tell you, because if you plug in zero for t, then all you're left with is the little constant in front, C4, or in this case, V0. So V0 is actually the concentration of virus when you've uh, substituted in zero for the t, which is time. OK, so that's a really nice way to test if your students know uh, separable differential equation methods. It's a great example. Um, it's uh, it's real world. So now I'm going to relate it to the data. So going back to our problem, um, not just the math piece, which is al always fun, but there's a real world problem we're working on. So in the study, uh, David Ho was treating patients. He was testing a therapy a protease inhibitor and collected blood samples from those patients. So that was the protease inhibitor that was given. And so if we plot plot those viral concentrations from those samples, um, they should, should show exponential decay. Um, and um, I'll say that that comes from this plot, I mean, sorry, this equation. So at the bottom there, you can see that what we're saying is this virus behaves that it goes down exponentially. If you put a protease inhibitor in the patient and give them that therapy, then their viral count should look like this, which is a um, exponential decay function. So that's a nice thing that we can ask students as well. Okay, um, so then we would look at the exponential decay. Here's again, kind of prototypical type data. And that's the equation that we had from before. Now it turns out in the real world, a lot of data have exponential behaviors and it's much easier for us to look at logarithms of that. So we take the natural logarithm of the data, which means I'm gonna call it y, I'm gonna call a function y, which is going to be the natural log of v. So that expression I have for V, I'm substituting that in. So you can see um, I, I just used what I had on the previous slide to substitute for V. And then I'm going to use rules of logarithms to start simplifying everything here. And again, only in the interest of time, I will I'll go through this, but it's always fun to get the students to tell you the answers, but that works better when we're not in a pandemic or if they are able to speak if you have the videos. So rules of logarithms I'm going to use, I'm gonna split the two terms inside that are multiplied. Rules of logarithms say that's the same as adding logarithms. So I've got two things added together and then rules of logarithms say that that exponent minus CT can, um, can actually, this is equivalent to having the minus CT in front of that log get rid of this little pointer. I don't think I need that. And, um, and then logarithm of E, the natural log of E is one. And so I'll write that as the minus CT there. And then I'm just going to rearrange it. I'm going to put the minus CT plus log of V0. And then the question is, what does this look like? We're getting some linear function responses. Great. So we have a line. What's the slope of the line? Minus C. Yeah, and great. Somebody volunteered the intercept as well. <laughs> great. Excellent. Excellent. So, um, so that's that's exactly what we have here. So we can get information from the intercept as well. I'm going to focus on the slope. So this is a line with slope minus C. We're going to get some patient data, and then we're going to fit a line to the data because if we take the log of the data, we should have a line, and we'll estimate the slope. 
C, remember C is what we wanted because one over C is the average lifespan. So all I have to do is figure out C and then take the reciprocal to calculate what's the average lifespan of the virus. Here are some real patient data from a paper that appeared in Nature. Um, and um, this patient, patient 303, I will need the pointer, um, has data here. We're just looking at after the start of therapy, which is at time zero. So after that, the slope, you can see that there's a negative slope. There's an estimate here that the slope is minus 0.21. And we're going to ignore the rest of this. That was um, another, uh, there was another explanation for why the slope would change later, but we're focused on the first slope. That matches the model we were just using. That's what they put in the paper. That, that model we just had, the single differential equation was they used. And so if our slope is minus 0.21, then C is 0.21. So if we think about, well, what's one over C? That's the lifespan. And um, we get that it's approximately five. So the lifespan of the virus is five days approximately. That was the big result of this paper that appeared in Nature and is one of the most highly cited scientific papers of our era. Now remember, we had this plot where we were looking at HIV levels and we said, well, they don't start reproducing until eight years, so it must live that long. However, we, um, what we realized, what people realized at the time was that that does not mean it can't reproduce before then. It just means that it's being killed before then also. So um, HIV therapy stopped working, but back to that question. But here I'm just going to point out what we're looking at does not represent growth only occurring, reproduction only occurring at year eight and beyond. It represents a fierce battle going on inside the patient between the virus and the cells that are trying to remove it. And the virus, one of the other pernicious things about this virus, in, in addition to its high mutation rate, fast mutation rate, is that it goes after cells that are, are sent to attack it and, and take it out. So it's a very uh, tough battle. So what it means is that um, the patient's immune cells are exhausted by this point in time. And that's when you start to see the virus winning. So up until then, lots of killing, killing a virus. Um, but the lifespan of the virus is apparently five days. So um, I'm going to, um, let's see, I want to focus on a couple of other things. So I'm not really, well, I will, I will go through this resistance argument. All right. So if the resistance is present at the beginning, then what we talked about before was you can treat it one, one drug at a time. Um, and so the question was, were there resistant virions before the therapy started or did they arise after therapy started? Um, and so by estimating the lifespan of the virus at five days, it was realized that there was a lot more production of virus than anybody thought. Lots and lots of replication occurring. Lots and lots of opportunities for mutations to occur. So with that many opportunities for mutation and the high mutation rate of the virus, um, it, was, it was night and day, it was very clear that was the most likely explanation that the uh, virus becomes resistant during the therapy. This means combination therapy is better. Now, why is that? I'll go through that argument. Um, so if it takes about 10,000 virions to get a resistant uh, virion, so that's the probability of resistance arising, one in 10,000. So we say about, and I'm waving my hands a little bit, but this is, this is roughly approximately right. That number 10,000 is not correct, but I want to be able to multiply and show some things. So if we have it that it takes about 10,000 virions before one of them turns out to randomly be resistant to a particular drug, then if we give drug A by itself, it takes about the time it will take to reproduce 10,000 virions before drug A stops working, then, then, um, then we know there'll be a, a resist, resistant virion and we're gonna lose that, that race. If we give drug B after drug A stops working is similar because we still have this independent chance of a resistant mutation arising that's resistant to drug B. So if we give both drugs simultaneously, the probability of resistance is actually one in 100 million um, because that's saying that the, they have to have a virion that's resistant to both simultaneously. So the probability that a, a mutation is resistant to one 
is one in 10,000. Probability that it's resistant to another is one in 10,000. Probability, independent probability that's resistant to both is the product of those. So one in 100 million. So that means um, instead of having to wait until we have 20,000 virions, we would have to wait until we get 100 million more before we expect a resistant strain to arise. So I'm going to summarize that. So resistance to drug A takes about 10,000 virions to get, and then you could treat with drug B after you finish the treatment with drug A. It would take another 10,000 to, to develop resistance. And then you would have the time for your patient that it would take for 2,000 virions to be produced to get the types that are going to be resistant. However, if you give them simultaneously, it's going to take 100 million virions. We're buying time for the patient when we give them simultaneously. And as a result, there's more probably, there's more that we can do with this. I'm, I'm really summarizing this, but that is the, those are the basic ideas there. Um, patients were suddenly no longer given single drug therapy. There was a very rapid paradigm shift. The paper came out in January of 1995, and by the middle of the year, um, with a presentation at a conference, it was clear. Everybody was on board. Um, we don't give the drugs one at a time so that then we'll have something once the first drug stops working. We give them, we give multiple drugs at the same time. That, that really did change the results for patients. David Ho was awarded Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Um, I actually invited Alan Perelson, the um, math researcher on this project, to come and speak at Stanford when I was running the applied math seminar there one semester. And uh, the room was packed with a lot of people from the medical school because the math department usually doesn't fill that room. <laughs> it's a large room. And so <clears throat> at the end of um, Alan Perelson's presentation, he was talking about some of his early work, viral dynamics and, and viral therapies. Um, one of the people in the room stood up, one of the physicians, and um, she said, I want you all to know, I never met Alan Perelson before in my life, but his work had great impact on our patients. Like that work was foundational. So that to me as a mathematician said, that was impactful. That really and truly was somebody who didn't know this person and just was in the room and said, this is really the way it happened. That had a, it was very nice to find that out. Um, I'm going to put a slide here that talks about, uh, that gives the details of the paper itself, the one that appeared in um, Nature. And then there's also a book, in addition to this paper that had that patient data set that I showed, there is a nice book, it's a small paperback book, um, and it describes this, how they figured this out and the race to figure out how long the virus lived and how imp important it was. Um, I'm going to <clears throat> also take another minute, I'm gonna drink of water, and share with you, if you or your students are interested in a career in biopharma, uh, if you know somebody, you can, you can tell them this information. So what is it that you, you would benefit from learning if you wanted to go and be a math modeler in biopharma and have impact by helping, for example, helping people figure out optimal regimens, therapies for patients? Well, differential equations, as we saw, is very useful. A lot of other mathematics, any mathematics that interests somebody will often be useful as background. We never know what type of mathematics we'll need. I was doing a problem recently where I ended up using machine learning. So I had to learn some machine learning. So it's nice if you have this breadth and you know about techniques. I knew about the techniques, so that was good. Um, computer programming is a must. We're always coding things up. We're doing, somebody mentioned earlier, use technology to solve a differential equation. We do that. That's exactly what we do. Our equations are often much more complex than the one I showed. So we're using numerical methods to, to give approximate solutions to those. Statistics, so useful because when you have data and you have mathematical equations, the way that they can talk to each other is statistics. Um, data mining, I mentioned, Machine learning is kind of in there as well. I will also emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough, the importance of communication and teamwork skills. And we are interviewing for my company right now, and we have questions exactly targeting those skills. Communication is one, teamwork is another. How helpful are they? Do they share when they're working? Are they happy to let people know what they've done or what they've learned? 
Um, and can they communicate well, especially with people whose expertise is very different than theirs. So if you're working with clinicians like David Ho and Alan Perelson, if you want that to be a successful collaboration, you want to be able to communicate well the mathematics. I'm going to pause there and uh, um, be very happy to take your questions from the chat. But thank you very much for your attention for, for this presentation. Thanks, Helen. I, there was a ch uh, question in the chat a little bit earlier, and I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, there was a question about how the slope of the re-expressed data translates to the actual rate of change. Yep. Oh, good question. So in fact, oh, that's an excellent question. I hope I can remember to mention that when I give the next presentation. So um, here we are with the data and there's a slope in there. And now the way that we had set up the derivative, the differential equation model, when we have that equation, it's exponential decay with a C in the exponent. So we have minus CT in the exponent. And actually, I think I have it on the previous slide. And so, um, yep, there it is. Um, yeah, so here you can see there is this exponential. We just took the log to plot the data and fit a line. When we plot the data, we expect we'll get a line. If, if everything, if our model is correct, the model says the data should be a straight line with slope minus C. But the original data set was exponential decay. So it's because of this, thanks to that logarithmic transformation that now all we have to do is fit a line. And on that line, we're, we're gonna use the slope to calculate to get C which was in our exponential. So that's one of the advantages for taking logarithms. We have great, I mean, of course we're doing this numerically. We're not actually doing the line pencil and paper, um, but, um, but numerically we have much better algorithms for fitting lines than we do for fitting exponential. I mean, slightly better. Exponentials are not so bad, but we always try to um, transform our data uh, to something that's, that's going to be able to be fit. I also, I, I wanna make the point here um, while I'm on this slide, sometimes we have students who ask, when am I ever going to need rules of logarithms? And so a great answer I think is HIV therapy. That's a, a good one. I think that we can all agree that that's a really good application there. Thanks Helen, the, the comment was the slope of the re-expression makes sense for what we did in physics lab. This was the same person who posed the question. And um, back in college, using semi-log semi -log didn't make sense. So it's pretty cool that we have this terrific, I think, application of semi-log re-expression. Yeah, lots of um, biological processes have these rates of decay. C times V will give you an exponential decay. Somebody knew that right off. They had a lot of experience to know that. And because the presence of so many exponential behaviors in biology, semi-log, exactly how they fit. Semi-log really helps us with those. A couple of other questions are coming in. One um, from Michael says, does the same thinking regarding using drug cocktails apply to cancer treatment? It does, it's a great question. So um, the question is, when is resistance arising? Because if resistance is already present, in fact, that is, um, that's something that we can do with genetic testing sometimes to see if the patient has a resistant mutation. If they do, we don't use that drug. It's not going to benefit very long because what we're going to do is we're going to kill all the cells. If we're thinking about cancer, tumor, tumor cells, we're going to kill all the tumor cells that are sensitive to the drug, but what's going to be left is some that are resistant. If we test and we see that there's already resistance present, some of the cells are resistant. So it's a, that's a race we can't usually win. Usually we can do better just by treating it with some other drug. But yes, yeah, same, same arguments for the cocktails we give to cancer patients. Um, lots and lots of combination regimens there for exactly the same reason, because the, the mutations are arising due to the pressure of the therapy, which kills off everything else. So who's left? Ones that happen to be resistant. Another question um, was about this graph and the, the person says, you know, the kids will focus on that uptick on the graph. Could you speak to what might have caused that? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. In fact, um, so I glossed over it. So this piece here represents the redistribution of virus. So this is circulating virus. We're getting plasma samples from patients. So we're getting a blood sample from their arm. We reduce it down to just part of the blood, the plasma, and then we look in there and see what concentration. Now that plasma, because it's circulating, it's um, 
and our bodies use the blood to, it perfuses our organs. So it, it, it brings oxygen and nutrients to our, our cells everywhere. And then it comes back in the blood. So the blood system, the arteries and the uh, veins, those are the blood vessels. And that's where we're taking a sample from, but there's lots of other cells, lots of other tissues. So what this represents is virus levels coming out of those tissues. This is actually the killing. This is the virus. Um, because it was in other tissues where it's slow to come back into the blood, it's just because it was it hadn't caught up to the blood yet to start being killed by the treatment that went into the blood. So I'll leave it at that. There's there there's a lot more that could be said, but I think that's hopefully it's helpful. That's very interesting. Um, there's another question. What's the thought process behind why the probabilities you mentioned are independent? Yes. Okay, so this is, there are some assumptions here um, that the probability that a mutation arises is independent of another. And what we see often in these um, virus and, and cancer situations, that seems to be the case. So this is probably related to the fact that a resistance, um, let's, um, talk about the virions here. If we have a virion that's resistant to a drug, it probably has a disadvantage in general uh, compared to the other virions that don't have, I'll talk about drug A, don't have resistance to drug A because if it, if it were better than the regular ones, if the resistant one were better, it would already be the dominant one and the drug would not work at all. And that's, what, that's not what we see in patients. So usually there are some assumptions about if you have a resistance strain, well, that's advantageous. If we you know, treat a patient with a drug, the virion has an advantage. However, it has to sacrifice. There's some kind of balance. So if it has that advantage against a therapy we might give, then it has to have some disadvantage. And usually it's the replication rate. So it doesn't reproduce as quickly. So it's just um, because of that, we think that... Um, the virions don't collect resistant strains. I mean, that's not advantageous for it to have a lot of resistance in it. Very disadvantageous. So that's part of the argument. I think um, I'm not giving it justice. There's a lot more, but that's one of the things that we can use to justify that argument that it's um, uh, ecologically disadvantageous. It's not an advantage to have a resistance strain. Uh, usually you have to sacrifice something like reproduction. So. So we don't expect that there are lots of them floating around with multiple resistance. So we expect it's independent. Thank you. I, th I think we're about out of time. So um, I did put in the, I just put in the chat, here I'll unmute um, my video. I put in the chat, um, the link to mathmodels.org where you can find the video of today's talk. And then Helen's gonna share her um, slides and then also a version of the paper that she referenced as well. Um, I wanna thank Helen. It's always such a pleasure to have you speak to us. And I hope that um, all of the attendees get inspired to go back and talk to their students, or maybe we have some students here too, get inspired to think about becoming math modelers. Um, it sounds like it's a great time to be a mathematical modeler. So we need you um, and we wanna invite you to come back Another time, maybe next year, we'll have, have you back for another talk. She gives lots of great talks about wonderful work that she's done. Um, and then the rest of you, if you wanna come uh, to our next webinar, we'll have it on February the 24th. And then we'll have another one lined up for March the 24th as well. And that, that information will be up on the mathmodels.org website. Um, so thank you all very much for your enthusiastic participation. And to you, Helen, as always, it's thank such you. a pleasure to have you. Thank and you. I am delighted that people were so willing to volunteer their answers in chat. As you know, these days teaching remotely, it's, it's challenging, but um, really appreciate the interest and the participation also. Hope